Tim Wiggum. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Fine, thanks, Eric. It's great to be here. Yeah, brilliant. Great to have you. Um, I was just thinking the other day, my goodness, um, what, what a kick in the solar plexus 2020 has been, right? It's been, uh, it's been kind of unrelenting so far. Um, how's it been for you guys and your family and your colleagues and your team and all of that just uh, in general? It's been a challenge. I think it's been a challenge for everyone. It was unexpected. I think uh, from a family and uh, business family perspective, 2019 was a great year and it felt as though, you know, after the, the downturn in the oil and gas industry in 2016, it felt that we were on the up and, uh, you know, 2017 and 18 had been slow building blocks. Uh, 2019, uh, I'm sure you'll agree, was, a, was a, a good year for Aberdeen and it felt as though, the industry was 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 growing and uh, and and everything was heading in the right direction. And then uh, at the beginning of 2020, as you say, Eric, it was a uh, it was an unexpected uh, blow to morale. Um, yeah. But equally, I'm a great believer that uh, through adversity comes opportunity to find out more about yourself uh, and find out more about uh, what 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 can be done to pivot. And, and to face that adversity and come out stronger for it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's probably uh, no shock to you and no shock to anyone that knows you, but that, that uh, theme is going to be what we're unpacking today about you, which is, which is great. Um, in terms of visibility on this from, I mean, you're head of performance improvement at, uh, at Exceed Energy, right? So yep. from a business perspective, when did you guys get visibility that this was, this was coming and was coming in hot? Was it, did you get early eyes on this or, or, or were you just like taking the news wires as they were coming in about how it was going to happen? When did you get visibility on it? Yeah, that's a great question, Eric, because uh, if I think back, we had no early warning. I would say, uh, I believe it happened over uh, a weekend. Uh, I can remember starting the year busy. I can remember going down to uh, or going across to Mexico to facilitate a large DWOP for a client in Mexico. Right. Coming back, going down to Mozambique to facilitate a workshop for a client in Mozambique for a big uh, gas development project that they've got down there. I can remember during those times uh, multitasking and supporting coaches on a number of projects in the North Sea uh, and indeed progressing business development conversations with clients in Southeast Asia. So all going the way it should, all going the all way going, it should. All going the way it should. And uh, I can remember getting back from uh, Mexico and um, saying to Ian Mills, who's the MD of Exceed and with whom I work very closely, I said, I've uh, got a, a business uh, conversation in uh, Aberdeen to discuss an opportunity for later in 2020. Uh, I can remember going to that meeting, coming back, feeling positive, And that was at the end of a week, going into a weekend. And I can remember watching the news about uh, COVID and uh, about the oil price crash and thinking, wow, this is uh, quite concerning. Yeah. But not necessarily thinking that it was the problem that it became. And it was actually literally the following uh, week on Monday that our management team got together and said, right, we're going to need to regroup, uh, review and refocus because this is clearly going to be a very different year to the one that we were expecting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's, um, let's put a pin in that right there. But let's rewind because... Um, your story, I mean, lots of people have jobs, lots of people have titles, right? Very few people that I meet actually define their title, right? Um, and, and I would put you very much in that band of someone who defines what they, what they give to the world um, uh, in, terms of, in terms of their occupation and their views on life. So performance has been a theme that's run through your life from probably from a very early age. So born in South Africa, right? Johannesburg? Correct. Yes. So let's let's give us the let's give us the, the whistle stop um, potted history of, of Tim and how how you end up here. And there's a few touch points that I'd like to stop and sort of pause on for a little while. So Johannesburg, um, I guess I guess it all started for you uh, at school and you know your parents putting you to the school that you went to, right? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for the kind introduction in that regard, Eric. Uh, you know, I think uh, very quickly I would say that. Uh, Performance defines me only because I have failed on many, many occasions, and I'm sure we'll come to that. Uh, and I've learned from that, and it's, 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 I've, had, I've had competitive DNA from a young age, 
Uh, and the reason that I do what I do now is because having failed many times and then worked hard to succeed in a few areas, I feel that I have something to offer to other people. But rewinding uh, to, to South Africa, yes, I was born uh, 1972 in Johannesburg. And very soon after I was born, uh, my dad got a job off uh, north of South Africa, Rhodesia as it was, Zimbabwe as it is today. So at a young age, we moved up to Zimbabwe. And uh, I grew up there and I was lucky enough to go to an outstanding secondary school in Zimbabwe called Falcon College. And I've always said that uh, my experience at Falcon was foundational to who I am today. It was outstanding uh, preparation for the Royal Marines that I ended up going into beyond school. and I'll come back to that. But Falcon College was the kind of school that was built on traditional values. And it was all about uh, challenging you, not just in the academic classroom, but also on the sports field and culturally. And it was the kind of school where you had to earn your way through the, the, the year groups uh, all the way up to, to the top. You were recognized for hard work. Um, you were recognized for teamwork. You understood that going to a school like Falcon, which is a boarding school uh, in the Madibililand uh, bushveld uh, outside of Bulawayo in Zimbabwe, you realized that to survive and thrive, you, you needed to show up, you needed to uh, give of your best, you needed to form positive relationships with your colleagues, your peers, as well as your seniors. Uh, but also you learn quite quickly that um, what goes around comes around. And I would right. say that that's an important principle in life that uh, I've tried to keep in mind when I treat others. Treat others the way that you would like to be treated um, is, is, is kind of a key principle for me. So uh, having uh, completed my time at Falcon College and really enjoyed um, leadership, so I was, I was head of house at Falcon College and I was very proud of that. And uh, at a school like Falcon, you had the opportunity to express yourself as, as a leader because it was a boarding school. You were responsible for 70, 80 boys in, in, in the house that uh, you were in charge of. And uh, the, the teachers and the, the housemasters gave a fair amount of, uh, of responsibility to the prefect body and uh, to the college prefects. So... If I look back, leadership was something that I enjoyed uh, and, and, and thrived in and, and wanted to utilize in my future career. I wasn't exactly sure how. But you, um, but you, got, but you got this sense, even as a teenager, you enjoyed this. This is something that you... Exactly. Yeah, 100%, this is something you 100%. felt comfortable in. Yeah, yeah 100%. And um, I was uh, captain of the uh, second team rugby at, at Falcon. And uh, I was very proud of that role. And uh, I played a number of games for first team. But looking back, what I really enjoyed about Falcon was how competitive it was even to just get into your own first team uh, rugby. You know, so even at school, let alone any other levels of representation, just to get into the first team uh, at rugby, you had to show up to every practice, give your best. Uh, and, and you knew you were up against some of the best in the country uh, for your age group. So... Leadership, my leader role in rugby, the sport of rugby, uh, the values and principles uh, and traditions of rugby, something that I've also held very dear through my life. Uh, and we can probably touch on that as well. Um, and uh, those are probably the, the key memories and the, the key um, areas of enjoyment from my time at Falcon. Uh, when I was approaching my last year at school, I looked around at what I was going to do, and uh, indeed, most of my peers were hoping to get uh, good enough A-levels to go to university in South Africa. So I guess I was part of that group, but it didn't sit well with me. I, looking back, I, I, I always had that sense of I want to do something hard post-school. I want to do something a little less ordinary. I want to really challenge myself. I want to be able to look back in later life and say, I went and did something really challenging. And that's not to say that university isn't challenging. Of course it is, course, but it yeah. didn't quite feel for me that that was what I needed to do. So I'm very grateful to my mum. She actually suggested a, uh, a year off. She said that she'd heard that uh, a gap year, a travel year, and she's a big fan of traveling and experiencing different cultures. So she strongly encouraged me, Eric, to take a year off. And so I found a, a friend of mine who was actually at a different school, but I'd been to, to primary school with him and we'd remained friends, who was keen on the same idea. And right. we bought something called a triangle ticket, which you could get from Zimbabwe at the time. It was over to Australia, 
um, and then from Australia to the Southeast Asia, Singapore, Thailand, and then across to the UK to, to, to experience Europe and then back down to Zimbabwe. So just, it was just a very- picking up, Just picking up jobs and doing interesting things on the, on the trip? Absolutely. That was the idea. Uh, now, of course, uh, looking back, the, the interesting thing was that 1991, which was when I took my gap year, it was a global uh, recession. Yep. So straight into a challenge, uh, difficult to pick up any odd jobs. I remember in uh, Sydney selling pots and pans. I remember up the east coast of uh, Australia in, in Queensland, uh, Bundaberg, uh, picking tomatoes to try and save some money to go on a scuba diving course further up on the Great Barrier Reef right. uh, and to go and do bungee jumping up in uh, Cairns. So, you know, that gap year, I grew up very quickly. My friend uh, left me after a month or two. He decided that uh, he wanted to get to London. Um, so that was fine, completely respected that, but that basically left me traveling on my own as an 18 year old, uh, through Australia, then through Southeast Asia, Singapore, Thailand, uh, and then got to the UK after about six months, having already grown up a huge amount. So big fish at a small pool, uh, in a small pool at Falcon college, uh, and then, uh, meeting the big wide world during a recession and trying to make ends meet and, uh, and trying to understand the world. So. When I got to the UK, Eric, so 18 year old, uh, my dad was actually over for a wedding at the time. And uh, we had a chat about my plans post gap year and uh, going to university. I'd got into University of Cape Town to, to study business. And my dad said, have you thought about the British military? Which I hadn't really. I was aware of a few friends at school who had been interested, but uh, I hadn't necessarily grabbed that idea and, and run with it. But in the UK, I found out a lot more about an opportunity in the military. And I was lucky enough to have some family who had been in the British military and were able to listen to what I enjoyed. They were already aware about the kind of person I was. And so I got the recommendation to look at the Royal Marines. And so I met a school's liaison officer. Um, I agreed and was given the opportunity to attend a potential officer's course, was lucky enough to get through that. Then the next stage is the Admiralty Interview Board, which is the next stage in selection. And I was lucky enough to get through those selection stages. Uh, it rolls off the tongue quite easily, but it was an extremely challenging series of, of, of selections. And, uh, you know, the Royal Marines is what it is because they know what they're looking for and they push you to the extreme to see if you have what they're looking for. Uh, the Royal Marines talks about a state of mind. Um, and, and they say in their kind of advertising campaigns, um, it's a mindset, you may have it, 99.9% um, .9 need not apply. So um, <laughs> I, just, I just love the fact that, that, I mean, I'm just thinking about um, the 18, 19 year olds that, that, that I know in my life and even saying, you know, okay, you're on a gap year. So you're, you're, you're thinking, I'm going to take a year off. I'm going to do some cool stuff. I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to get some experience and have some great stories. And then I'll probably think about going to, going to university. I just love the whole sliding doors thing. If you hadn't gone to the UK, if your father hadn't been there for that wedding, would you have had that conversation? Would you have gone into the Marines? I think it's fascinating. And, and just, just even the concept of having that conversation, you know, you can maybe, you can maybe think about going into the Marines is, is in, incredible that an 18, 19 year old would even go, yeah, that's, 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 uh, that's not a bad show. I'll give that a go. So, so, that's, that's fascinating. You go through the selection and now you're in the Marines. Yeah, again, it sounds, uh, <laughs> sounds pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, uh, easy, easy, done. You and I both know it's not straightforward. Uh, you know, you're joining uh, a, an incredible tradition, uh, an incredible reputation. Uh, you are rubbing shoulders with some outstanding people uh, who I always reflect I had the privilege and honor to serve alongside uh, for a relatively short period of time, uh, considering the Royal Marines history, which goes back to 1664. Uh, I did eight, just over eight years in the Royal Marines. There are many that do a full career of 20, 30 years plus. So 
the first thing that springs to mind when I even talk about the Royal Marines is the immense privilege and honor that I had to, to serve yeah. in, in the Royal Marines. And as you say, Eric, yes, so I got through uh, selection. Uh, ad adversity came knocking for me again because uh, having passed all the selection and, and being due to start in the May of 92, I was playing rugby uh, in Zimbabwe. I was actually doing, uh, playing rugby sevens and um, trying to get into the national sevens team and progressing towards that when uh, I had quite a significant knee injury, which meant that I was not going to be able to start at the, uh, the designated time and I was going to need to start with a later group of young officers in training. So if I look back, again, these setbacks have, have been quite formative for me. Uh, don't take anything for granted. Uh, ex expect the unexpected, which is uh, a strap line that the Royal Marines use all the time. So when I did eventually join, it was September 1992. And uh, I went down to Limpston, somewhat apprehensive, like everyone is when you go to start training in the Royal Marines. And uh, I joined uh, 35 other young officers, including two Jamaicans uh, who came over from Jamaica to join uh, the young officer batch for the start of training. Uh, and, and training lasted for 15 months. Uh, and it was a roller coaster journey, including the, uh, the commando course, which is four weeks uh, culminating in the commando tests, uh, which have been designed to test you when you're at your lowest ebb, um, but to make sure that you have the resolve and the determination and the fitness and the energy to get through those commando tests and earn the Green Beret and your commando flashes uh, and the opportunity to join the Royal Marines uh, as a fully-fledged uh, commando and to go off and uh, protect freedom and to uh, go on operational tours and to train alongside, as I said, some outstanding people um, in the Royal Marines. So, so um, yeah, it, you know, not understanding that world, you know, anything that I know about the military, I see on, I see in films, I see in the news, I read in books, right? So I, 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 can't, I can't exactly relate but we all feel we know a little bit about the military. So, so for, for, those that, for those that don't know, going in as an officer um, and achieving officer rank in the, in the Marines means that you were in charge of some people, right? And you, you took some people into some pretty, pretty hairy places and were in charge of people, in charge of operations. Where, where, did, where did your eight years in the Marines take you? It's an interesting question, that, because... Uh, on reflection here in 2020, looking back, of course, um, the 2000 to, to 2010 and just beyond was an extremely challenging time for, uh, for, the, for the world because, yeah. of course, sep September 11th, uh, 2001, 9-11 happened. And fairly soon after that, Royal Marines and all other members of the British Armed Forces and, and, and the American Armed Forces and indeed many others were involved in combating terrorism in places like Afghanistan, Iraq. So mm. the reason I say that is my time uh, in the 90s was relatively placid, relatively peaceful compared to the time a decade later. However, uh, in the 90s, um, the troubles in Northern Ireland were, were still going on, uh, certainly in the early 90s. So yeah. uh, I joined 4-2 Commando uh, out of training and uh, we, we went to Norway where we did a winter warfare deployment. Um, so that's all about learning how to operate in Arctic conditions, which I thoroughly enjoyed and was an opportunity to get to know the Royal Marines in the troop that I'd been, uh, been given the privilege to lead. Uh, we did um, three months over in Norway. And then when we got back, we did what we used to call a beat up preparation for a tour of Northern Ireland. Uh, so I went over to South Armagh and uh, along with the uh, company of Royal Marines that I was with, uh, basically what we did was to patrol the area and to try and help the people in general to work towards a peaceful solution, which ultimately came towards the end of the 90s, but not without significant challenge as, as you'll be aware. So Northern Ireland was one of the places that I went to. Interestingly, towards the latter end of my eight years in the Royal Marines, I had the opportunity when I was with 4-2 Commando again as the officer commanding mortar troop to deploy to Sierra Leone, West Africa, 
Uh, and that was a very interesting time because that was when the whole blood diamonds uh, yeah. conversation was going on. And when the uh, Liberian backed uh, child soldiers were advancing across Sierra Leone, um, just a scorched earth approach yeah to the villages that they were going through. And they were advancing on Freetown, the appropriately named Freetown, uh, where they intended to reap, uh, wreak havoc uh, and to cause major problems. And it, it, the worst thing about it, Eric, was that because the incumbent president had a mantra of one hand, one vote, or one arm, one vote, sadly, these child soldiers uh, who were generally uh, drugged up and, uh, and, 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 and high on, uh, on that kind of warrior um, yeah. uh, spirit. They were hacking hands and feet off people. They were maiming people as they went. It was an absolute human travesty. And um, so the role that I played along with 4-2 Commando, I was actually one of the first uh, from HMS Ocean, the uh, commando carrier on shore to liaise with the commanding officer of uh, two para, which had been the spearhead battalion that had come over from the UK onto the ground in, in Freetown to look at defending uh, Lungi Airfield and Freetown from the advancing uh, Revolutionary United Front uh, and to pave the way for more UN troops to come in. So I went on shore, liaised with the CO of Two Para in advance of 4-2 uh, Commando coming on shore to then take over and to defend uh, Freetown and, and Lungi Airfield. And I had an interesting role, Eric, because I was, um, as I say, OC mortar troops. So we needed to adjust a number of targets uh, on the approach routes to Freetown. And uh, so I needed to be in a helicopter actually most of the time alongside the mortar fire controllers to adjust those targets and to make sure that if the enemy was approaching, if the uh, RUF were approaching to cause problems in Freetown, we could um, defend the town against them. And so, for the first week, we were constantly in Lynx helicopters, um, speaking to our mortar lines, firing uh, mortar rounds uh, onto the approach routes to make sure that we had some targets pre-adjusted in case we needed to use them. Good Lord. Good Lord. No, I, I'm, yeah, I find, I find it all just absolutely fascinating and terrifying at the same time. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I remember... Um, I recently spoke to Steve Beedy, who was one of our guests on the Cruxcast, who's an ex-British uh, uh, Army veteran, and asked them this question. Sorry to dump it on you, but so you, you're you in charge of uh, a team of people. Um, you've got operational responsibility. I'm guessing that you you make a plan with the data that you have, right? But like everything in life, things change, right? Now, I'm comparing this. This is a, a comparison against the business world that we face today. So from a military perspective, as a leader, um, when things change against the plan, what's your, what's your stick that you grab for? What's your, your go-to thing? And how do you handle that? You know, we had a plan, it's now changed. How do we regroup? How do we focus? And, and maybe even a comparison into the business world right now. It's very interesting. We are taught early on uh, in the Royal Marines to expect the unexpected. And uh, we're also fully aware and trained from early on in training that uh, no plan survives contact with the enemy or no plan survives contact with reality, which is very transferable to the business world. And interestingly enough, very transferable to 2020 and, and COVID as we were discussing earlier. Yeah. So, you know, we always used to say that it's not about the plan, it's about the planning. So what that means is, and what that represents for me and, and, and used to represent for my peers uh, and Marines in the Royal Marines, but indeed for colleagues now at Exceed and, and places that I've worked is, the planning is representative of the leading indicators, the, the activities over which we have control. Uh, and that includes contingency planning. So when we talk about the plan, inverted commas, we believe that that should always include contingency plans and decision trees that such that when things change, when things don't go as planned, when we face adversity, we have already thought about actions on, as we used to say in the Royal Marines, actions on contact, you know, actions on ambush, actions on unexpected events taking place. Now, 
you cannot predict absolutely everything that will happen to you. We couldn't in Sierra Leone or Northern Ireland, and we couldn't uh, today at Exceed in terms of business, we couldn't have predicted COVID. However, because we are always planning and contingency planning, we have a strong team. We have a high performing team. And I can very much relate to high performing teams from my time in the Royal Marines, because I believe that they have some of the best teamwork in the world and they understand high performance. Indeed, they select for high performance, they train for high performance. So yeah. I've become quite familiar with the principles of high performing teams. And in my book, Accelerating Automatic, which I've recently published, well, this I one. talk about, yes, I'm glad you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> I talk about that very thing, make it automatic. So when things go wrong, as they always will, make it almost habitually automatic that your executive team, your leadership team, immediately regroups, immediately reviews the situation, and then immediately refocuses on how to mitigate the problem and the adversity and how to go forward because the plan needs to change. However, we were expecting the unexpected. We are never uh, complacent and resting on our laurels because we know that just around the next corner could be the next challenge. So I guess just in summary in, in, in the, on, on this point, Eric, I mean, it's really just important that the planning involves a team that starts to trust each other and indeed becomes really respectful of each other, trusting of each other, trusting each other's judgment. And I'm going to reference Ian Mills at Exceed, someone who I work with now uh, very closely is the MD and founder of Exceed. And for me, he is a, a brilliant example of a leader who is best when his back is against the wall and when he needs to rally the other leaders to face adversity. And that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what we did as ex at Exceed uh, when COVID hit, as we said, right guys, this is not what we wanted. It's not what we expected, but it's what we've got. So what we need to do now is fully understand the implications, uh, what it means for us and how we can best survive physically, emotionally, uh, and then economically to thrive for another day, be that 2021, be that 2022. We need to make sure that we can look after our people and be ready to respond when we get the opportunity going forward. I love that. I love that phrase. No plan survives contact with reality. I love that. I think that's brilliant. So we're actually writing the plan knowing that this is, this is just what we think now. And we know because we expect the unexpected, we know that this is going to change. So when it does change, uh, sorry, cheesy rugby analogy. The scrum stays tight. We don't fall apart. We expected that this would change and now we just need to deal with it. And we, 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 we quickly act and we make smart decisions based on the fact that we always knew it was going to change. So this is no big drama. Um, I love that. I think that might be the title of this. No plan survives contact with reality. <laughs> Maybe the title for your next book, Tim. That's a good one. It's a very it's a good, good one. one. Now, talk, talking about books, talking about books, sorry. To, so the latest one, and I say latest, Accelerating Automatic, is uh, a fantastic read. When I say it's a great little book, I, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. It's the fact that it's, it's punchy. It's, it's easy to read. It's something you could keep in your bag. It's a little kind of uh, guide, but it does focus very much on, do you just want, to, just want to unpack what Accelerating Automatic means? You talk about the three M's, and I'm interested in that. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I, what I did, going back to the last downturn in the oil and gas industry, interestingly enough, I was thinking, you know, how do, how do I get the message out as, as a thought leader in the space of performance and leadership to more people? And it occurred to me then that using LinkedIn as an opportunity to provide insights was, was a great way to get more leaders in the oil and gas industry to think about what leadership truly means and what it means to take a new team facing new challenges to new heights. And so back in 2016, I started writing weekly insights and I continued that discipline for three years and, and I published three books, Inspired, Inspired uh, Two and Inspired Again. And when I got to, to this year, I thought actually I've provided insights, but I haven't necessarily revisited them because I just loved the process. I enjoyed the process of writing. I still enjoy the process of writing. And I thought, you know what, if I was to go back and look at those insights and actually try and structure them and organize them in a more logical way that could help leaders in any industry, but particularly the heavy industries uh, in, in the high risk, high reliability, high ego environments, yeah. um, then good how point. would I put good, them good together? Point. Good point. <laughs> so, 
what I did was I, I looked at that and you know what's interesting, Eric, is that the three M's that I'm going to talk about, they jumped out at me. I didn't premeditate on those. Right. I, they jumped out at me. I realized, and of course, it's also linked to the conversations I have with people like yourself and others who are always studying the human condition and, and, and how humans can get better. So it, what jumped out at me was there were articles and insights that I had put together, which were very much around mindset which right. includes leadership. It's led by leadership. But this whole piece around mindset and motivation and having the right positive approach to getting things done. Then there was method. Now, method's a fairly obvious one. You know, any business, any group, whether it's the Royal Marines, whether it's Exceed where I work now, whether it's a big super major in the oil industry, they're going to use systems. Um, and people, of course, are now talking about uh, digitalization, which is the use of more digital tools within our systems. So method how things are done, the process. And then the other one, now this for me, Eric, this was the real breakthrough for me in the last year or so. It's this M of mood. Now mood, some people go mood, what, what, what do you mean? Well, mood is another word for climate. And I learned this from a colleague, Chris Milliner at Performance Climate Systems, where they talk about the climate being the mood, uh, whereas the culture is more the personality. Now, changing someone's personality or culture is difficult. It's like trying to change the direction of a huge super tanker. Yeah. Whereas changing the climate or changing your mood is more like uh, changing the direction of a small boat or a yacht, which is a lot, it's a lot more easy to do. It doesn't mean it's totally easy, but it, it's, it's more easily done. So mood is something that leaders can influence in an organization. It's the ambience, it's the atmosphere, it's the environment in which we work. You'll know as well as I do, Eric, and in fact, we, we, we discussed this recently when we chatted. You can go to, to one offshore rig, you can get off the, the chopper, the helicopter, and you can spend a couple of hours on the rig and you can get a sense of the prevailing atmosphere on that rig. Right. And for example, you can get the sense that on one rig, it's a really poor uh, atmosphere. It's, a, it's an atmosphere in which people are scared, scared to speak their mind, scared to express themselves, worried about what's going to be said to them, looking over their shoulder. Whereas you can land on another rig, maybe for the same company, and you can get off the chopper, spend a couple of hours, have some fantastic conversations with people and really feel that this is a positive atmosphere. It's a great environment. It's an environment where I know that I can thrive, where my ideas and expressions will be greatly appreciated and factored into the planning. So mood is the M that I was most excited about when I wrote yeah. this book. So the three M's are mindset, method, and mood. And what I wanted to do with this book, Eric, Accelerating Automatic, was talk about how leaders can accelerate their team's performance from average to automatic and what are the accelerators. And so by taking articles that I'd done and segregating them into ones that relate to mindset, ones that relate to method and ones that relate to mood, I was trying to identify those accelerators, which can hopefully help us to get from average when we start to automatic high performance as soon as possible. And so, so I thoroughly enjoyed putting it together and I love revisiting the articles myself because they have evolved through reading and observing, listening and talking to some of the best in the business. And I'm talking about sports teams. I love following sports teams. For example, the All Blacks. The All Blacks always comes up, even though I'm a I'm a diehard green and gold Springbok supporter. Uh, <laughs> I just think the, the All Blacks are such a fun, and you're a rugby guy yourself as well, Eric. The All Blacks, don't they? They just represent such a great example of the legacy. And indeed, that book, Legacy, is one of my favorites uh, from J James Kerr. Just the principles that the All Blacks have, which have made them such a great team, the world's best in rugby, even though they've got one of the smallest populations of yeah. any country on earth. Yeah, incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, no, I, I, uh, I, I loved, I loved the book. I'm going to go back and try and get a hold of the, the other ones. Um, but that, that mood part, you know, just the analogy you gave there of, of, uh, you know, that, that, that mood having such an influence, we spoke about, we had a conversation the other day about how you can have two rigs owned by the same company, pretty much the same generation rig, same structural uh, components and stuff doing the same job with the same amount of people to the same procedures, like chalk and cheese in terms of performance. 
And generally that sense that you get as soon as the helicopter door opens or if you meet them in a yard or whatever, you get that sense really quickly just how the mood is in that place, just from just from the, the sense of it. And and you're you're so right how that mood can affect how the maintenance is done, uh the how the, the kit's operated, how the it, you know, usually it creeps into accidents and incidents records, things like that. And, and you know, and we we've got two of the same facilities, maybe working 50 miles apart in the same body of water, doing exactly the same stuff to the same procedures um, with completely different performance and how that mindset coming through into mood changes everything. I once, uh, I once asked a guy, I once asked a guy about that, that we were talking to because he was having some problems. And he said, uh, what do you expect? You're looking for F1 driver performance for bin man wages. And I thought, wow, we've got a huge problem. Yeah, this problem's way, way, way deeper than I thought. I thought we just had a guy that was having some problems, but this is a, this is a kind of toxic environment. But yet that place over there, they're they're enjoying what they do. They've got, and what does it come down to? It comes down to the generally the people that are leading it, the people that are in charge, and the mood that they set. Yeah, you're spot on, Eric. And if I can just pick up again, because I, I love talking about this subject. You know, in the model that I espouse in accelerating automatic the connection between mindset and mood is leadership mm. uh, and it's 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 about inspiring excellence and simon sinek who's a well-known leadership expert he talks about one of the best places to learn how to lead well or to look for lessons is parenting mm -hmm. and what we're talking about as you and i would, would both know is in the home environment in the domestic environment if dad or mum or both are in a bad mood and we can all relate to this, having either been a child or a parent or both, it affects the children. It affects their happiness, their productivity, their collaboration. Focus, everything. Their yeah. focus. And it's exactly the same if you think about an oil rig environment or any organization. If the key leaders are in a bad mood or treat people badly, then is it any wonder that that affects the atmosphere affects the conditions within which people are working it affects their willingness to collaborate and to speak freely and to offer ideas um, if someone has a good idea takes it to a key leader in any environment and is immediately shut down or told to shut up and go away is that individual likely to come up with future ideas no he, he or she is going to be running scared worried about what's going to happen next looking over their shoulder worrying if they're going to lose their job these are obvious points, but sadly, they are not necessarily obviously applied in many organizations. So yeah, one of my key aims with the book was really just to get some ideas out there and some awareness out there to all leaders about the importance of their role in creating the conditions for others to flourish and yeah. their role in the organizational mood. Very good, very good. So, so just zipping forward, and it's a shame to do this because there are so many stories that we, we should probably do particular crutzcasts just on that one story. <laughs> um, but zipping through to today um, and the story about how you, how you met up with Ian and, and uh, joined in with what was going on at Exceed and all of that is interesting in itself. But let's talk about today. So Head of Performance Improvement at Exceed. So many of the people watching this will understand drilling campaigns um things like that where where does what you and your team do fit into that overall process just the 30 second elevator speech yeah so we strongly believe that with stable technology uh, and strong leadership we can bring a structured approach to unlock team potential and to achieve high performance so yeah. We have worked hard at Exceed Performance to develop the tools within the toolkit to help leaders take their teams from new and average to automatic high performance. And so really what we've specialized in, uh, Eric, is, is the piece between people and process. So right. helping leaders and teams come together during the readiness to execute phase and to go through structured activities to set themselves up for success. So we're talking there about, for example, the drilling the well on paper workshops, um, making sure that there's a risk session so that the key people are around the right table discussing the risks that might affect this campaign and doing their damnedest to mitigate those risks. Um, having an action tracker prior to 
execution to make sure that we've addressed everything that we can, leaving no stone unturned to get ready to start the first activity on the critical path in the best position that we can be. Right. And then during the execution phase, we provide a performance coach who's embedded amongst the leadership team at the front line. So typically offshore uh, on a rig, but we've supported onshore teams as well. And that performance coach is responsible on behalf of the leaders and the leadership team, both offshore and onshore, to implement a proven and structured approach to performance improvement. And we are learning all the time. So we're evolving our toolkit all the time. It's not to say that we have a silver bullet or we have the only way to get things done. But we do believe that after 15, 20 plus years, being passionate about performance improvement, particularly in the heavy industry space, that we have got 12 steps that really work to accelerate that improvement uh, for any team and to get to their best of the best as soon as possible, and then to sustain that high level of performance by adhering to those proven disciplines of improvement. Fantastic. Listen, it's a, it's a horrible thing to do to you, but I'm going to ask you the medical question, the famous medical question. Given what you've been through in your life, given what you've seen in your life, given all the, the, the nuance and essence that you've picked up through the military, now into um, performance improvement and all of that, um, a lot of people have the stuff and kicked out of them over the last few months. And there are individuals and businesses that are, you know, flagging, absolutely flagging right now. And maybe a little bit confused, maybe a little bit kind of skeptical about what the world holds for them in the coming months and years. If you had, uh, if you had the megaphone and you were able to get up in front of oil and gas as a community or even Aberdeen, what would your, what would your hopes and desires be for change coming out of this? Because I do think in any crisis there's opportunity, right? In any crisis there's an opportunity for change. What, was, what is one thing I've asked a few guests this. One thing that you would like to see is do a little bit better when we come out of this um, and, and get back to, to, to working as we knew it. I think it goes back to something that I mentioned earlier, Eric, uh, which is uh, a key principle uh, that I try to live by and that I see a number of outstanding leaders worth following try to live by. And that is to help others succeed uh, and treat others as you would like to be treated. So there's a thread of kindness that, that comes through there. I think we've seen in the past a little bit too much of dog eat dog yeah. and uh, you know, success at, at, all, at, at any cost. And I think one of, the, what, one of the learning points from COVID for all of us as a human race is that that doesn't work. We need to help others succeed we need to treat others in the way that we'd like to be treated because we're all in this together. Yeah. We're all in this human race together. Yeah. So boiling that down to the microcosm, if you like, of Aberdeen or Scotland oil industry, the same applies. We need to help others succeed. We need to be open to different ways of doing things different to how we've done them in the past, because arguably the recent pandemic and its impact on the oil price, its impact on the energy conversation and indeed renewables, alternative mm. energy sources, we feel, and indeed with digital, we're going through a transformative time and it's more important than ever before to be respectful of others, to help others find opportunity to listen to the voices of others rather than shutting down further and not being interested in collaboration. So kindness, collaboration, helping others succeed, treating others as we would like to be treated. That's my gut answer to your question. How that actually manifests yeah. tactically and on the street, that's a difficult one and probably warrants a longer conversation. But we can start with what we can influence, which is how we treat others. And I think that's possibly the most important learning uh, and something that leaders should apply at this time. I think that's a, a, a beautifully apt um, and, uh, and realistic place to, to close this little conversation with, uh, with you, Tim. Thank you so much for sharing what you've shared. Um, if anyone wants to talk to you about, even if it's directly related to performance improvement in well delivery or your books or even want to chat about the military years or rugby 
which we never really got into because there's a whole, we could probably do a good hour on rugby definitely. and your, your stories least. from, yeah, definitely at least. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and then we never even touched on CrossFit as well. I think we're going to have to yeah. come back to you, Tim, is what I'm saying. I think we have to make a Very date happy. in a few months to come back and just talk about that. Because I'm, sure I'm sure there's some learning from uh, CrossFit and rugby that you could pull into this too. But if anybody wants to chat with you, I'm guessing LinkedIn's a go-to and we'll tag you in at the top. But you'd have quite happy to have anyone drop you a line and just have a conversation. Yes, please, Eric. And I'm learning from you when it comes to LinkedIn. So I couldn't agree more. Uh, LinkedIn is the place to, to talk. Uh, I, I, would, I would absolutely say yes. So please uh, tag me there. And if anyone wants to get in touch, um, get hold of me on LinkedIn. That'd be good. It's been an absolute pleasure. And we look forward to seeing you again, Tim. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Eric. Same to you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye.